Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Which AMD RX 570 graphics card should you buy? Comparison video. In this video, we're going to be comparing multiple RX 570 cards as well as providing benchmarks of the 580, the 560, and the GTX 1060, which these directly compete with. At the end of this video, I'm going to be talking about the size of the cards, the different models available, what kind of games they play, and then specific recommendations on what I think you might want to consider buying. So what is an RX 570? An RX 570 is a slightly cut down version of an RX 580. It's about 10% slower than an RX 580. They're roughly equivalent in performance to the GTX 1060 three gigabyte card to put it into perspective. They are much, much faster than an RX 560, however, as I'll show you in the benchmarks later in the video. You can find the RX 570 starting at about $160 normally, more on that in a minute, and they run up to about $200 for the nice large card such as this Gaming X here with two fans and a large oversized heatsink. So what kinds of games do you buy an RX 570 for? Well, first of all, let me state that there are two categories of games. There are AAA, high budget, fancy, flashy games, and then there are casual and esports titles. What are AAA or big budget games? Battlefield 1, Mass Effect Andromeda, Ghost Recon Wildlands, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, Prey, the upcoming Call of Duty World War II. Those type of games require high-end graphics and high-end computers to really shine and look really nice. Now at 1080p resolution, the RX 570 will play all those games just fine. Having said that, I would recommend buying an RX 580 if those games are your principal interest. It's a little bit faster and I would recommend an 8GB card rather than a 4GB card for those kind of games if you're looking to get 3 years of use out of your card. Now what about esports and casual games? These are League of Legends, Dota 2, Minecraft, World of Tanks, World of Warships, uh, Overwatch, Heroes of the Storm, and other such games. Those at 1080p or 1440p are absolutely perfect on an RX 570. Now you don't need a 570. Actually a 560, as I'll show you later, will actually do just well on many of those games, at least at 1080p. Some, such as World of Tanks and Overwatch at 1440p will benefit from the higher performance of an RX 570 over a 560 but the 570 costs more. Now I'm going to do a separate video on which 560 should you buy, but if you're looking for a bit of a premium experience even in casual and esports titles, or you're looking to play at 1440p, or you're looking to play at higher frame rates, if you want 100 to 144 frames per second, get a 570. If you're okay with 60 frames per second, then a 560 will be plenty. One more thing to take into consideration is multiple monitors. If you are interested in playing on three 1080p monitors side by side for ultra wide AMD Affinity Gaming, and you wanna play World of Tanks or even League of Legends, then I would still recommend an RX 570 for the extra performance and the additional monitor connectors on the back. Many of these cards have three display ports or multiple HDMI ports, versus the ports that are on the 560s, which are usually one HDMI, one display port, and one DVI port, making connections more difficult. Furthermore, three 1080p monitors are six million pixels. So even though League of Legends and World of Tanks are not tremendously demanding, six million pixels is a lot to push, and I would buy an RX 570 for casual and esports titles if you're interested in multi-monitor gaming. So if you've decided that an RX 570 is for you, the next question is which one to buy? There are so many different cards to choose from. In fact, most companies make multiple cards in different configurations. Let me separate this out into two simple categories. Cards designed for pre-built systems with limited space and limited power, and cards designed for custom-built machines with more power available and more room for larger cards. A good example for pre-built systems such as an Acer Aspire, Mini Tower Case, an HP, Lenovo, Dell would be this Sapphire Mini ITX card right here. It is relatively short, not much longer than the PCI Express slot itself. It uses only a single six pin PCI Express power connector, which is very helpful in pre-built systems. Many Dells actually do come, at least modern Dells, come with a power supply with a single six pin power connector but not an eight. All these other cards require eight pin connectors. This one only uses six. 
so it's easier to install in a smaller pre-built system. Of course, it's also designed for many ITX custom-built systems because of its shorter size, but it's great. The Acer Aspire T, $450 computer that I've covered in the, in the past, this fits in very nicely. Now, please note this card is kind of a middle bridge card between the RX 560s and the 570, which is what this is. We have a single HDMI, a single display port, and a single DVI connector. So if you wanna hook up multiple monitors, you can. This will support three monitors, but there's three separate types of connectors. Let me compare that to a card for a custom-built machine. This MSI Armor Overclocked card. Notice we have two fans. Notice it is substantially longer than the Sapphire Pulse card. It has an 8-pin PCI Express power connector. There are pre-builts that will have an 8-pin, but very, very few. Now, you can replace your power supply, but this card, for example, will not fit into the Acer Aspire T desktop. It's too long. You run into the drive cages. Where the hard drive is, for example, would run right into this card. And, of course, the, the printed circuit board extends the whole way, so you can't shorten it. Now, this card does have the benefit of five uh, video out ports. We have a DisplayPort 1.4 here for up to 1440p resolution. We have a single HDMI 2.0 port here for 4K. Yes, this does support 4K. And then we have three display ports. If you want to connect multiple monitors, if you want to play everything from World of Tanks, World of Warships, League of Legends on 3 1080p, or even 3 1440p, League of Legends would play fine on this at 1440p, even ultra wide. You can plug those into these display ports right here. If your monitors are HDMI only, you can buy display port to HDMI monitors for just a couple of bucks a piece, or you can buy adapters either way. So you can easily hook up multiple identical monitors using these ports right back here. Now this card is faster than this one. How much so? A few percent. It's not dramatic. It does run a bit cooler in temperature, and the fans, because they've got a larger heat sink and two fans to work with, can turn slower. So it makes a little bit less noise, a little bit less heat, for a little bit more performance than the Sapphire Pulse Mini ITX card does. That being said, if I did a blind test with the average person not telling you which card was which and I didn't put the frame rate up on the screen, do I think you actually would notice? No. We're only talking about maybe a two to four frame per second difference between the Sapphire Pulse card and the Armor OC or any of the other higher end cards. Yes, there's a difference. It's not a major difference. If you've got a system with this won't fit in, then it's not really an issue. Buy the Sapphire Pulse Mini ITX or one of the other mini style cards such as this. But if your computer has room, if you have the physical space inside your machine and the 8-pin PCI Express power connector, skip the mini cards and get one of these. Lower temperatures, faster speed, less noise. Now, what's the difference between the Armor card and, say, the MSI card or one of the other brands? Size, cooling, and the default factory overclock speed. The MSI Gaming X is a taller card with a larger heat sink than the Armor OC. It'll run maybe two degrees cooler. It's a very small difference. The fans are larger, so they can move the same volume of air by turning slower. So it'll be maybe two decibels quieter. It's a small difference. Now, the video out ports on the Gaming X are a little bit different than the Armor OC, and be sure to check that because each card has a slightly different video out port configuration. The Gaming X has two HDMI and two display ports. The Armor OC has one HDMI and three display ports. That's for virtual reality. If you want to plug in, for example, a single 1080p monitor and then an Oculus Rift or an HTC5 uh, VR headset. But that's really beside the point. If you're serious about virtual reality, you should not be buying an RX 570. Even though it says VR ready on the box, you should be buying at least a 580, if not something faster, perhaps AMD's upcoming Vega or one of the faster Nvidia cards. Either one would be a better choice for VR than an RX 570. Now, there are many other brands of cards out there besides what's here on the desk, PowerColor, Gigabyte, and more. 
Are they good cards? Sure, I own many Gigabyte cards. I have no issues with them whatsoever. I simply can't afford to buy every card on the market to put onto my desk and to test for you. So all I'll say is that principally I would buy based upon price and the configuration, what video out ports, how many fans, and what kind of computer you're going to install it in. Um, whichever card happens to be the least expensive at the time is what I personally would buy, assuming you're happy with the aesthetics of the color and the design, etc. One interesting thing I'll point out before we move on to the next topic is the ASUS ROG Strix card has a kind of unique configuration. It has two DVI ports. So it actually has two DVI 1.4s with only a single HDMI and a single display port. That's a bit different. I don't know if any of the other cards have that. So if you by chance need a graphics card with two DVI ports, the ASUS ROG Strix RX570 is for you. But if you want multiple display ports or multiple HDMI ports, then one of the other cards would be your best choice. What computer would I install an RX570 into? Now I already talked about pre-built versus custom built. Putting that issue aside, let's talk about CPU for a minute. What kind of processor, how old of a computer should you consider installing an RX 570 into? The truth of the matter is, anything from the past five to seven years is just fine. Do you have an older second gen machine from Intel, say an i5-2400, or even an older i3 machine? Do you have an older AMD chip, one of the older FX 6300 or 8300 chips? This is a great graphics card for those machines. There are very few games that really won't run on those older processors when you get a modern graphics card and put them in. I've done those videos on my channel in the past, installing newer graphics cards in older machines and showing just how well those older CPUs really do still perform. Having said that, there are exceptions. Some games are far more CPU dependent than they are GPU dependent. World of Warships, for example, is actually more CPU dependent than it is graphics card dependent. Grand Theft Auto V is more CPU dependent. But those are the exceptions, not the rule. In general, your CPU matters less than your graphics card, so long as your CPU is not being a bottleneck. Now, covering that is a topic for another video, but do be sure you look at my older CPU comparisons where I compare five and six year old CPUs to brand new CPUs in modern games and show you where the limitations lie and where they don't. Okay, that's enough talking about the cards. Why don't I show you some benchmarks with the RX 560, 570, 580, and the three gigabyte GTX 1060, which is the most comparable card to this. I'm gonna do a split screen, four benchmarks on top of each other. MSI afterburner numbers will be on this side of the screen. The labels on this side of the screen will let you know which card is being tested. Now, before we get to the benchmarks, I wanna talk about the current supply situation and pricing on these cards in the end of June, beginning of July, 2017. If you're watching this video in the future, timestamps in the video description below will let you fast forward. Just click on the start of the benchmarks down there and it will zip the video ahead a little bit and put you right to the tests. But if you're watching this video at say, the beginning of July, 2017, I do wanna talk about the fact that you currently can't buy one of these cards for anything remotely approaching reasonable prices. This situation will correct itself. If you're watching this video in October or November and you're saying, what are you talking about? There are $170 everywhere. Yes, I'm sure they will be and it'll be just fine. But in the summer of 2017, there was a major massive shortage on these cards. These cards are going for double retail price right now. I wanna talk about that. If you don't wanna see it, click on the link in the video description below to fast forward the video automatically to the benchmarks. Still with me? Awesome. What I want to talk about is cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin and Ethereum. For those of you not familiar with it, essentially cryptocurrency is a new form of electronic currency that is created using math instead of by fiat, by governments. The US dollar, the euro, for example, are simply created out of thin air by central banks of large nations. Cryptocurrencies are not. They are created through mathematical calculations that generate them slowly over time rather than being printed uh, by, a, by a central government. Now, there are many places you can use cryptocurrencies online, Bitcoin being the most famous one, but there are others. And essentially, this is an alternative currency. It's a store of value that is completely electronic and is uh, removed from any central control of a government. Now, there has been a large price rise recently in the conversions between conventional currencies, such as dollars and euros, and digital cryptocurrencies, such as Ethereum and Bitcoins. 
Now, I'm not interested in getting into whether this is a good thing or a bad thing because that could be debated in its own video. But what it has meant is that cryptocurrency miners have bought up every available RX 570 and 580 card pretty much everywhere in the world and has shot the prices of these in the summer of 2017 straight through the roof. These cards were available between $170 to $200 just about four to six weeks ago, but they're currently running double that. Many of these cards are going for between four to $500 each at the moment. And that price simply makes no sense for gamers. If you're looking for a card for gaming, you can buy a GTX 1080 for those prices. And a 1080 is a solid 75% faster than most 570s. It would make no sense whatsoever to pay four to $500 for an RX 570 or 580 for that matter. What would I pay for these cards? Not a penny more than $200 because for about 220 at normal prices, you can get an RX 580, which is what they were at launch. 170 to 200 is the normal retail prices for these cards. And if you can find one for those prices, great. And if you're watching this video in the future, if you're watching this in October or November of 2017, and you go click on the links in the video description to Amazon and Newegg and go, what are you talking about? These things are available everywhere for $170. Great, then that means that manufacturing has caught up with demand. There's plenty of cards to go around. Definitely buy one, I recommend it. But if you cannot find one for those prices, you have three choices. Wait, buy more graphics card, or buy less graphics card. Currently at the end of June of 2017, when I'm filming this video, the RX 560s have not been hit yet, and you can still find those in the $110 to $130 price range. Those are normal priced. Now, those might go up here at some point in the future, so I wouldn't pay a penny more than about $130 for an RX 560. The RX 560 is substantially slower than these, but if these aren't available at normal prices, buy an RX 560 if you need a card to tide you over. Just live with it, turn down the details a bit, and use it until Sanity comes back into graphics card pricing at the mid-levels. The other option you have is to go higher. Currently, a GTX 1080 is available for about $500 on both Amazon and Newegg. For $500, you get a card that is a solid 70 to 80% faster than, it depends upon the card, of course, some are overclocked more than others, but you're looking at not quite double the performance for almost the same price. Some of these 570s and 580s really are going for four to $500 a piece, and you should buy a GTX 1080 at those price points. In fact, you can go whole hog, so to speak, and buy a 1080 Ti for 700, and basically get a card that is double the performance of an RX 580, about 110 to 120% faster than a 570. So those are your choices. Go down to a RX 560 or a 1050 or 1050 Ti, go up to a 1080 or a 1080 Ti, or just wait, because there is no sense in spending too much money on these cards, at least until sane prices come back. The first benchmark I wanna show you is Ghost Recon Wildlands. Now, in the previous RX 580 video, I did the built-in benchmark. This time, I decided to show you live gameplay. Yes, this is a little bit hard to see because I'm showing them stacked one on top of the other. The very top one, we have the RX 560, then the 570, the 580, and then the GTX 1063 gigabyte card. For those of you curious, the 1063 gigabyte card is the MSI Gaming X, the RX 580 is the ASUS ROG Strix card, the RX 570 is also the ASUS ROG Strix card, and the RX 560 is the Sapphire single fan card. I do have to say that I was pleasantly surprised at how playable Ghost Recon Wildlands really was on all these cards. Yes, even the RX 560. No, the frame rate's not great. However, I had no problem playing the game, even at that frame rate. It was very responsive and very playable. Now, it may not be in every mission and every part of the game. For the RX 560, I was just running around getting convoys and supplies and that sort of thing, but I did play for nearly 20 minutes. It was a lot of fun, and I stopped noticing the frame rate after a while, unless I was looking at the real-time numbers. But you just start playing the game and having fun, and it really is no big deal. Now, in terms of the RX 570, which is why you're watching this video, notice that we're over 60 frames per second. High detail, 1080p, no issues whatsoever, not even Ghost Recon Wildlands. Ghost Recon Wildlands, Mass Effect Andromeda, The Division, GTA 5, they all play 60 frames per second or better, high detail or better, 1080p on the RX 570. 
What about the 580? Notice we have better performance. Now you cannot second by second, frame by frame, compare these numbers because of course they're in different parts of the game. But in general, you're gonna see that RX 580 is about 10 frames a second. Sometimes it's five frames a second faster, sometimes it's 20. It varies, in fact, right that second, it was slower, but that was just because I was in the middle of a big battle on the 580. What about the 1060? The three gigabyte 1060 is very close in performance to the RX 570. The six gigabyte 1060 is very close in performance to the RX 580. When all of these cards were normal priced, my recommendation in the summer of 2017 was to either go for an RX 580 or a six gig 1060. My advice was a bit different six months ago and last year when the 400 series launched because you could get such good deals on the RX 470s and the three gigabyte 1060s. But the price delta has narrowed. My general advice between a four gig RX 570 and an eight gig RX 580 is that I wanna see at least a $50 price difference there before it's worth coming down to the 570. If there's a 30 or $25 price difference, then it simply isn't worth the money, you should get the RX 580. Likewise with the GTX 1060 3 versus 6 gig. When they launched, there was a $60 price difference. The 6 gig card is not worth $60 more, in my opinion, than the 3 gig card. However, when they were in stock a few weeks ago, the price difference had narrowed to under $30. I saw it dip down to $20 at one point. For $20 or $30, yes, get the 6 gig card all day long. You get more VRAM and more performance. The 3 gig version is slower than the 6 gig on the 1060s. Now, please note, on the RX 570, the four gig and the eight gig cards are exactly the same performance. The only difference is VRAM and it only matters if the game needs more of it. Now, if you're looking at the real-time VRAM use, we're using about 3.1, 3.2 gigabytes of VRAM on the RX 570 and RX 580. Now you might say, well, great, wouldn't then eight gigs help? No, look at the eight gig RX 580. It doesn't make any difference. We're high detail at 1080p. Now, some people might respond, well, great, but what if I want to run at very high detail at 1440p? Awesome, get yourself a GTX 1080 or a new upcoming Vega card. Neither the RX 570 nor the RX 580 have the compute horsepower necessary to run very high detail at 1440. Yes, you would need more than four gigs of VRAM to, to be sure not to run out. But since the cards don't have the power to do it anyway, who cares? Now. When the RX 580 launched, for example, there was, I kid you not, a $20 price difference between the four and the eight gig card. 220 versus 200. Sure, for $20 for 10%, get the eight gig, be a little bit future proof. But in general, the four gig cards are just fine. If you find an RX 570 for a reasonable price for under $200, get it. It's a great card for 1080p gaming. Okay, that's enough of Ghost Recon Wildlands. Why don't we look at an easier title? We're gonna play World of Tanks. Now we only have the RX 560 and the RX 570 here. The 580 of course plays it perfectly as does the GTX 1060. So I'm just gonna focus on the two lower level cards here and on the AMD side. Now what you're going to notice is a respectable frame rate difference between these two replays. Same computer again, i7 7700K running at five five gigahertz, 16 gigs of DDR4, 3200 megahertz RAM, and of course, 1080p. We are at maximum detail. We were at high detail preset in Ghost Recon, but here we are at maximum detail. Everything's cranked to the max. Full screen anti-aliasing is turned on. Dynamic render resolution is turned off. The detail slider is to maximum. And of course, we are running in full screen. Now, not to worry, benchmark charts showing the average and the 1% lows for each of these runs will be coming up here in a minute. But I think it's important to see the real time frame rate of the game. How is the game actually performing as it plays? How much VRAM is it using? How much CPU is it using? One thing you'll notice is that World of Tanks most certainly does not need an i7 7700K running at five gigahertz to give great performance. It also doesn't need a top end graphics card. Now, as we're playing, you'll notice that the RX 560 stays maxed out to 100% most of the time, but the RX 570 does not. That is because World of Tanks is capped to 120 frames per second. 
as we hit about 120 frames a second, you'll see the RX 570 dip down. Now these are at 1080p, 1440p would show more demand and it would show an even bigger difference between these two cards. But it's easier using my Elgato HD60S external capture card to record games without any performance penalty whatsoever, but it does limit me to 1080p. If I do World of Tanks on RX 570 versus 580 versus Vega, for example, it will definitely be at 1440p or 4K, but then I'll have to use AMD's ReLive capture software rather than the Elgato capture card. So that's why we're at 1080p. But if you're interested in a great 1080p card, as I said earlier, if you want faster than um, 60 frames per second, if you want 100 frames a second, 100 and, well in this case 120 is the best we can do, roll the tanks limita limiting it. But if you want high frame rates, the RX 570 is actually plenty in most of these kinds of games. There is one interesting thing I'd like to point out between these two cards. 1300 megahertz on the core clock on both cards, 1750 megahertz on the VRAM on both cards. So they should perform the same. Wait, no, wait a minute. The RX 560 has nearly half the number of actual compute shaders as the RX 570. Four gigs of VRAM both cards, clock speeds are the same, same high-end CPU, but you notice a dramatic frame rate difference here. And there are plenty of times when the RX 570, you just saw the percentage drop there again, is not being fully utilized because of that 120 frame rate cap. So basically the RX 570 really is that much faster than the 560, and it's because of the number of compute shaders, the actual processing cores on board that it has compared to the 560. Having said all that, the RX 560 is a great World of Tanks gaming card. We are in fact at nearly 80 frames per second. Now this has been World of Tanks. How about Overwatch? Overwatch is a wonderfully fun game that does in fact need a dedicated graphics card to provide high resolution and high detail. Does it play on integrated graphics? Yes, and I've shown that on my channel in the past, but it really is a much better experience overall with a dedicated gaming graphics card. Again, on the top we have the RX 560, and on the bottom we have the RX 570. You're looking at the Sapphire versus the Asus ROG Strix, both 1300 MHz, again both 1750 on the VRAM, both 4 gig cards, although 2 gigabytes is all you need. We are, by the way, at maximum detail in Overwatch. It's set to epic as the preset, and yes, I did double check that each of the items, texture, uh, detail was set to high. Everything was turned up as high as it would go. Everything was ultra. Everything was cranked to the absolute max on both runs. Both graphics cards are 100% utilized, and they're going to pretty much stay that way throughout the run. Notice our frame rate. We are getting not quite, but nearly double the frame rate on the RX 570 versus the 560. If you want 60 frame per second 1080p gaming, set it to high detail or set it to ultra on the RX 560 and that is absolutely all you need. If on the other hand you want 100 to 144 frames per second, the RX 570 is the card to buy. If you have a 1080p 144 hertz panel, don't run it at epic detail, run it at high detail and you'll get 144 frames per second all day long, assuming you have a really good CPU. Now please note that at the higher frame rates, a really high clock CPU is needed. An i5-7600K, or you know a 6600K would be fine. It doesn't have to be an i7 because uh, Overwatch does not use all the threads of an i7 versus an i5, let's say. But you do want a high clock rate if high frame rate gaming is something you're interested in. 60 to 100 frames per second, a non-overclock chip would be just fine. A Ryzen 5 1500X would be just fine. An i5-2400 would be okay from six years ago. But if you're looking for 120 to 140 frames a second, you really do need that four plus gigahertz clock speed in order to get high frame rates, no matter how much graphics card you buy. And that's simply due to the fact that the graphics card will end up sitting around waiting for the CPU as the frame rate increases. But for anything 100 frames per second or lower, it really doesn't make as much difference as what CPU you use. Now that has been enough of Overwatch, why don't we go take a look at the results? The first benchmark result I'm going to show you is Ghost Recon Wildlands. Again, high detail, 1080p. Notice that the RX 570, 580, and GTX 1060 really aren't that much further apart from each other. Now the RX 580 is faster. It isn't necessarily reflected so much in this chart simply because of where I was at. It's a live gameplay rather than the built-in benchmark. The built-in benchmark 
actually shows a few frames per second more difference here, but I thought I would try something different and do the actual gameplay rather than just the built-in benchmark. Now I know this video is for the RX 570. I do have to say that I was shockingly surprised at how playable this really was on the 560, even at 30 frames per second. I didn't have any problem spending nearly 20 minutes driving around, shooting up convoys, stealing vehicles. I stole a helicopter at one point. The game was incredibly controllable, so that really actually took me a bit by surprise. Turning the detail down to medium might get better overall frame rates, but even at high, it was very playable. Want 60 frames per second? An RX 570 is all you need. Now I'm gonna show you World of Tanks. As you can see here, there is a large and dramatic performance difference between these two cards. 46 frames per second on the 1% minimum on the RX 560 versus 99 frames per second on the 1% minimum on the RX 570. The averages are a little closer simply because the RX 570 is capped to the 120 frame per second rate that World of Tanks is stuck at. Otherwise, that average would have been way above 117 frames per second. But the short answer is if you want high refresh rate gaming at 1080p in esports titles or casual games, World of Tanks, World of Warships, League of Legends, Counter-Strike, Global Offensive, and so on, then the RX 570 is absolutely worth every penny at normal retail prices over a 560. But for 60 frames per second gaming, the RX 560 is all you need for those kind of games. Now you may see that 46 and 36 frames per second minimum on the RX 560, and that's true, but we were at max detail with everything cranked out. Turn it down to high detail instead of max, and you will be over 60 frames per second without an issue. Maybe I'll test that and show it on the RX 560 comparison video, but it really is fine and very, very controllable. Finally, that leads us to Overwatch. Epic detail, 1080p, 97 frames per second average on the RX 570, 79 frames per second on the 1% minimum, and 74 frames per second on the 0.1% minimum. Compared to the RX 560, this is a massive jump in performance. But again, just like World of Tanks, let me be clear, this is at max epic detail, and I did double check that everything was turned up. On the RX 560, turn it down to high detail. It's still beautiful, the game is the same, and you will get way over 60 frames per second. Want 144 frames per second? On the RX 570, turn it down to high detail and you'll get up there. So basically this is showing you max epic detail with excellent performance on either card, whether or not you're okay with the lower numbers on the 560 or just turn the detail down. But the RX 570 really is that much faster. And as I said before, for these kind of games, Overwatch, World of Tanks, etc., for 100 to 144 frames per second, it's a great, great card. Just turn it from epic down to maybe ultra or high detail if you want those frame rates. Just a quick note for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with it, the average should be pretty self-explanatory. It adds up all the frames displayed, divides it by the total number of frames, and shows a number. The 1% minimum and the 0.1% minimum, however, are a little bit different. They're not true minimums. There may be a couple of frames below those numbers. The red bars are the ones that I think that most people should focus on. The red bar means that will be your minimum 99% of the time. Essentially, it drops the bottom 1% of the frames and says that's your minimum 99% of the time. The blue bars take it one decimal place further, 99.9% .9 of the time. So the blue bars are really, really close to the true minimum. The red bars are sort of the playable minimum, the kind of minimum that you will notice in intense combat scenes, but maybe not notice the 10 or 15 lower frames in a 10 or 20 minute gameplay session that really otherwise aren't noticeable and don't affect the overall performance. So there you have the benchmarks for the RX 560, 570, 580, and a GTX 1063 gig card. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with that big huge red button directly below this video. Questions and comments in the comment section, and as always, please check out the video description. Links to Amazon and Newegg for everything I've shown you in this video, for all the 570s, as well as the 560, 580, 1063 gig cards, and even the GTX 1080s, because if you're watching this video when these cards are $500, go buy a 1080 if you've got the budget for that because it is much, much faster than these cards. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you next time.